This is A New Angle, a show about cool people doing awesome things in and around Montana. I'm your host, Justin Angle. This show is supported by First Security Bank, Blackfoot Communications, and the University of Montana College of Business. Hey folks, welcome back and thanks for tuning in. It is Pledge Week here at Montana Public Radio, and today I'm speaking with Kenneth Stern, director of the Bard Center for the Study of Hate. He's also an award-winning author, scholar, and attorney. Ken has argued before the Supreme Court and testified in front of Congress. What I find you know, difficult is that people tend to you know, jump to conclusions about anti-Semitism and overlay some of the complexity of the different narratives. Ken will be visiting the University of Montana community on November 6th as part of the President's Lecture Series. We recorded this conversation prior to the recent eruption in violence between Hamas and Israel. Ken, thanks for coming on the show. It's my absolute pleasure. So tell us, where did you grow up and what did your parents do? Well, I grew up in New York City and both my parents uh, were physicians. My father was a surgeon and my mother was a pediatric hematologist. And could you give us a brief summary of how you would position yourself on the intellectual landscape? Like, how, how did you get into this, this work and, and what area do you think you're particularly interested in? Well, I, I you know, grew up in the 50s and 60s uh, before going to college in the early 70s. And so I grew up in the civil rights era and the uh, anti-Vietnam War era. And I, um, you know, went to, went to college, sort of the tail end of the anti-Vietnam protests and so forth. And you know, I was always sort of concerned about, you know, social justice, civil rights. And, you know, hate has always sort of intrigued me uh, intellectually. Uh, but it wasn't really the focus of what I was doing in college. And I went to Bard where... Um, I'm actually employed now. And I ended up going to law school in, in Oregon. And I started seeing some anti-Semitism too. So mm. that, that drove me you know, to work on issues of anti-Semitism for 25 years at the American Jewish Committee. I was the point person on anti-Semitism, the director of the division. But I've always you know, been fascinated much more than just the sort of siloed aspect of any particular hatred. I've always been interested in why, you know, why do we as human beings have this tendency to see who's in us and who's of them? And how does that turn into hatred? And how does that turn into hateful violence? So can we press on that last piece a little bit? Like, what is hate? How would you define it? Yeah, I mean, hate, it's really very interesting because it's partly, you know, an attitude, it's partly behavior, it's partly an emotion, and it's very perplexing, right? Because there's, you know, to me, it, the, the root of it is, again, the capacity of human beings to see who's us and who's them. And it has, you know, to me, two different aspects, and, and it looks at the capacity and see the world that way, why and how it leads to demonization or dehumanization of other people, because, you know, there are differences that are innocuous, sure. um, but there are some that become not so innocuous and also, you know, uh, can lead to questions of, like I said, of, of violence. So we're looking at things that, that curtail it and things that uh, promote it and the definition of hate studies incorporates both the sort of visceral angry hatred that we you know think of most you know i hate them and get your blood boiling but also the things that um are seen as normative divide people and lead to demonization or dehumanization i mean we think of slavery as a sure. uh as a good example that's just how things were most people would they didn't get their blood boiling unless you were victimized by it uh but the people that were promoting it just didn't you know they, they this is just how the world was supposed to work. So those are the things that that I think that are important for us to look at. And there's so much richness in each of the various disciplines that look at that capacity, but it, it hasn't been sufficiently pulled together to give us sort of theories of what to do and, and what not to do. And that, that's part of uh, why I think hate studies is such an important you know, emerging field because it 
will help provide theories for groups like on the ground there, the Montana Human Rights Network and nationally groups like you know, the ADL or the NAACP and other groups that have worked in, you know, one of them, the American Jewish Committee. I can tell you that there's no sort of you know, testable theory that we refer back to that comes out of the academy that says, how do we think about what we're doing, what we choose to do, what government chooses to do, what philanthropies choose to do, what works and what doesn't, what are the principles we should be thinking about. Um, and it, it's partly to build, to make us smarter about that, that hate studies exists. Yeah. Can you summarize what we know about how, I think the phrase you used, innocuous forms of just you know, group partisanship, like rivalry between colleges, for example, can transform from something like that, that sort of is a, is a normal course of, of human decision making to something that is really pernicious. There, you know, there's no simple train that takes you from point A to point B. Clearly, for most people, whether you're, I'm from New York, whether you're a Giants or a Jets fan or you're, you know, root against the Red Sox and for the Yankees, that generally, um, you know, pretty innocuous. But there are forms of identity that become really central to people and empowering to people. And they, you know, can lead to people actually giving over their uh, sort of being to this. This is really who I am. I'm from New York. I'm Jewish. I'm a father. I'm a husband. I'm a suffering Knicks fan. This will be 50 years since they last won a championship, which I remember in 73. <laughs> um, you know, and we're all, all these things, but for some folks, just one thing, whether you're white or whether you're Christian or whether you're, you know, if you look at the Israel Palestine stuff, your the identity of one group or another can become, you know, very much the core of who you are. And we know that when, you know, things like that happen, people tend to really maximize looking for uh, the simplest answers. We're sort of uncomfortable with complexity sometimes. And when you start uh, down that road and you have uh, political figures and culture and other you know, messengers in society saying, yeah, that's right, they are a danger. Um, you know, that's a problem. We see some of it in, in how you know, cable news works, right? So there's, as you've said several times already, there are many factors that kind of contribute into this this space. Uh, we were just talking a moment ago about the media landscape and how that has a sorting mechanism. And the algorithms of, of engagement have figured out that enragement is the way to keep us engaged. And we seem to be living through a moment where almost everything is being framed as part of identity and we're encouraged to make pieces of our identity so salient. Um, are we living through a unique time with with regard to how we think of identity and how we're sort of encouraged to uh, construct our identities? I don't think it's a unique time. I think that there are unique circumstances at the current time. What's sort of different is we have different ways of of encouraging people and discouraging people from going you know down these paths you know one of the things that people talk about is the the danger of, of hate on social media which mm -hmm. is you know real but you know people talked about danger of the printing press and then the radio and then television so it, you always have new vehicles one of the things that social media has done, though, is to encourage people to go further into these buckets. But on the flip side of it, um, it's also let a lot of us see what was really behind closed doors before and have a better understanding of what's going on in our world. Yeah. So, you know, the, to me, the, the, the hateful ideas of the core, the delivery system is interesting and maybe ways of using the delivery system to promote hate or using the delivery system to combat hate and how we should think about using them you know, more effectively to combat hate. To me, very strongly without censorship. But the, it's the ideas and the capacity of humans to, to just be you know, seduced into these comforting buckets of 
vilifying the other that, that interests me the most. Sure. And so let's talk about anti-Semitism in particular. Is anti-Semitism, I mean, it certainly has a complex and long history. Is it an especially pernicious form of hate? Is it, is it operate differently um, than other forms of hate? Yes and no. I mean, I, I think that anti-Semitism is a subset of the human capacity to hate. There's no question about that. It's not like the only type of hatred that, that plagues the world. Um, and each type of hatred has some of its unique characteristics, although they all share you know, the, the cornerstone, the bedrock of who's the us, who's the them. There are reasons why anti-Semitism has existed for so long. I mean, part of it early on was, was theology. And for our purposes, we could just talk about you know, the beginning of Christianity. I mean, you have a society where this is a truth that, you know, Jesus is God and that society is built around that. And then you have these stubborn people who say, you know, we, we don't believe that. And what do you do with people who are outside the societal, you know, conclusion that this is, this is the truth. So that's why Jews historically were ghettoized and, uh, kept out of certain trades and so forth. And, you know, it's shown us an example of what happens when you reject you know, the, the obvious truth. And then, you know, later on, especially once you started having uh, ideas of race, you know, with Darwin and, and others, the idea of Jews as a religion got subsumed to the idea of Jews as a sort of racial group. Now, Jews aren't a race. Jews are many races. Jews are a people. And we can talk about that more if you want. But that type of thinking got infused into how people thought of Jews, especially with some of the, you know, the old line religious background. Tropes about Jews conspired to harm humanity. And that conspiracy explains what goes wrong in the world. Hmm. And those sorts of tropes got sort of modernized. So you had something called the, you know, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which is a czarist forgery, but promoted in the United States very much by people like Henry Ford that talked about everything that goes wrong, controlling the media, controlling, you know, every, the government, controlling money, all this is, you know, it's all a, a Jewish conspiracy. Those those things, you know, had a, a lot of, of staying power. So you still see, you know, some of that. But when I talk to congregations about anti-Semitism today, you know, because people obviously get concerned when they hear Kanye West or they see other things, you know, the desecration of a synagogue, flyers out, uh, all those things. There are a bunch of different measures. So one of them is the number of hate crimes. One of them is the number of attitudes, which is still, you know, fairly, fairly good. I mean, compared to, uh, you know, to where we were a hundred years ago. But anti-Semitism, you know, gives people the, a, a vehicle, a, a consistent ideological and sometimes in some places, uh, a theological way of uh, understanding their world and what goes wrong with it. And it's all the Jews' fault. We'll be back to my conversation with Ken Stern after this short break. A New Angle is supported by First Security Bank, Blackfoot Communications, and UM's College of Business. Access to capital, broadband, and education are three ingredients any community needs for success. Hi, this is Anya Jabor, Regents Professor of History at the University of Montana, and you are listening to A New Angle. Welcome back to A New Angle. I'm speaking with Ken Stern about hate and anti-Semitism. And is there a way to bridge from that understanding of anti-Semitism to how, to how the lay listener can understand the Israel-Palestine debate? Both of our political parties try to compete for their support for Israel in many ways. But those positions we hear articulated by some of our political leaders don't necessarily align with some of the views of the members of their, you know, the, the voters within their parties. So how do we kind of understand how the, that role of anti-Semitism in, in this country has sort of mapped on to how we should understand the Israel-Palestine debate and how it's framed? So, you know, from a 
sort of mainstream Jewish perspective, if you look back over the last, you know, 140 years, there is you know, always a Jewish yearning for the land of Israel. If you read the Bible, you know, the, the Hebrew Bible, you see the connection of Jews to the land. It, it's very palatable and strong. It's religious, it's cultural, it's identity. Um, and it's historic. You know, there have always been uh, Jews in the land now, you know, known as Israel. But the, the movement of Jews to Israel from other places in the world was partly uh, a response to anti-Semitism first, and a lot of, of especially after the Holocaust, um, and the obvious implications of where anti-Semitism could lead, that led to you know the the establishment of Israel. In the aftermath of the establishment of Israel, a lot of the Jews that were historically in uh, Middle Eastern uh, places, both Arab and non-Arab uh, places, you know, Iran, Iraq. Uh, Egypt, Morocco, a lot of Jews were sort of forced out. No, I mean, not sort of, I mean, they really were. Obviously, you have also an Arab community there that, for understandable reasons, was entirely happy with this influx of new people that was, you know, coming in and having some capacity to have an impact on their lives. What I find, you know, difficult is that people tend to, you know, jump to conclusions about anti-Semitism and overlay some of the complexity of the different narratives. So for some folks who are Jewish um, and who are Zionists, like, like I am, I believe in the, you know, the right of Israel to exist, there are some folks who will see anti-Zionism as saying, well, this is just anti-Semitism because it's denying to Jews the same right everybody else. Has. So how could you deny that? This is part of my identity. It's a core. Mm -hmm. Or you have to be able to have the emotional capacity to look at people that look at the world differently. And I know, and I'm friends with some, you know, Palestinian academics and activists and others who are not anti-Semitic. They just don't like the fact of what it, what Israel's existence means to them. They don't believe in the tropes. They don't play into those stereotypes. Uh, they just have a, a, a different view. So, you know, there's one group that basically says that, you know, tries to put everything that happens that's, that's, uh, you know, harshly critical of Israel in, in ways more than, you know, Jews internally could be, in, uh, critical of some things that happen in Israel and try to paint that as anti-Semitic. And to me, that cheapens the term. And there are some on the other side who say that it's all about, uh, a, a national conflict and ignore some of the manifestations of anti-Semitism that we do see. Again, because we each want to be in our own community and have easy answers to difficult questions. And so you mentioned a moment ago your, your, your latest book, The Conflict Over the Conflict, the Israel-Palestine Campus Debate. This is a debate that has, has raged on many college campuses. However, it hasn't been super salient at the University of Montana campus, um, at least not in the 12 years that I've been here. Can you briefly summarize what is happening on campuses and why it is so alarming? To put it in perspective, I think, you know, what's happening in, in, in Missoula is, is more of the norm. In most places, Israel is not uh, a burning issue on campus. Yeah. There are some campuses where it is, and those tend to draw, you know, attention. This is a difficult political issue. People have strong feelings about it. So you have all these different views and attitudes and connections to an issue. And there's a temptation to try to shut out the other side, rather than saying, this is a really good educational opportunity. We've seen too many times where there's a desire to just, you know, stop speech and violate academic freedom. It could be from the pro-Palestinian side uh, trying to you know, use heckler vetoes to shut down speakers. And I've seen it uh, from the pro-Israel side too. Everybody's trying to get the other side to, to not have a forum. And that that's neither, you know, something I think consistent with free speech ideas. And it certainly isn't something that would take you know, maximum advantage of a campus's ability to teach about this and to have students think about why this is 
such a disquieting issue for so many. I'd like to think of campuses as a place where these sorts of ideas should be debated and students should be exposed to them. And that discomfort that comes with being exposed to a variety of ideas, many of which you don't agree with, I mean, that is the the value of the education in many ways. How can universities do better? The basic idea is that opinions and things that people say are ones that even we fundamentally disagree with it. We don't want to be in a position that tries to use instruments of state to suppress, you know, those, those ideas. Sure. Uh, I'm not saying ignore them. And I'm say- not saying, you know, that people should be harassed. Of course, they shouldn't. People shouldn't be intimidated. People shouldn't be bullied. People shouldn't be discriminated against. But there's a, a, a fundamental difference between bullying, intimidation, and so forth, and hearing something you don't like. The notion that, you know, that we want authority to, to stop speech we don't like is, again, very much in that black and white, you know, good and bad uh, you know, view of the world. If you give government the power to decide what speech is okay and what isn't, just based on its content, not on true threats and things like that, but just on the content that it, it, it's you know inherently disturbing, um, government's going to always opt to stop the speech it doesn't like, not the speech you or I might like. So I think it's a a terrible model. It's not like there aren't other ways to fight back against speech we don't like. And one of them, uh, you know, that that, uh, I think I mentioned in the book actually happened in Montana. You know, you recall a few years ago the threats against the Jews in in Whitefish, Montana, and there was going to be an armed march uh, on Martin Luther King Day in 2017. And I worked with the Montana Human Rights Network. I was running a small foundation at the time to use social media, to get people to make pledges of money tied to if this this group actually showed up and marched, it would go to things that they would detest. So security for the people being threatened, police training, anti-bias education, and so forth. Uh, They ended up not showing up, but what it did is it made people on the ground there feel that others around the world supported them by going for that pledge, and it gave people something concrete to do. So that's just one example. It's not the question of we su- suppress speech we don't like, sure. uh, or we have to allow it and ignore it. There are many, to me, much more effective things that we can do. But when we expect some sort of rule to be a big delete key, we miss all those things that are you know, much, much more valuable to me in the long run against uh, hate. Yeah, I certainly agree with you that you know, any state mechanism to, to constrain speech is a big problem. There are some cultural mechanisms that are concerning as well. There has been a trend toward more higher percentages of faculty, particularly in social sciences, uh, self-identifying as liberal over the course of the last 30 years. Campuses have grown more liberal in their political uh, disposition across the faculty. That can create a sort of group think. I mean, campuses are not often a, a safe place for small c conservatives or capital C conservatives in many ways. And is, is that a problem? I mean, it's certainly creating fractures in how our populace views higher education as a, as, a, as a good that has value. What do you think of that as far as groupthink on a college campus? Yeah, I, I think you know, it can exist in some places, in, in some departments and so forth. I, I'm sure uh, it does. But you know, to... And one of the things that I'm very pleased at, at Bard, even though it probably uh, also, I'm sure also has, you know, people much more to the left. The president there has from time to time, you know, just made a point of bringing in conservative speakers because, again, there are conservatives in the world. And you want to have people that, um, you know, can expose students to a different way of right. thinking. But it, it also comes down to the question for individual faculty of what's my job and i think we see sometimes i mean i've seen on some of the israel palestine debate i've seen outside groups that ah somebody has this view you know it's going to be a problem it's going to make jewish students feel uncomfortable and to me it's it's not (laughs) 
you know, necessarily so. When I teach on anti-Semitism, we always have a section, of course, on Israel and Zionism and so forth. And, you know, we live in the, in the age of, of Google, right? People can know what I think. They can Google. So I'm not going to hide it. Uh, and I'm going to tell them this is what I think. And I'm going to say to them, I do to say to them, the only way for sure to get a bad grade in my class is to parrot back to me what you think I think. Mm. I want to hear what you think. Yeah. yeah. I love that wisdom of remember what our jobs are. And that takes courage. You know, it takes courage at the faculty level. It takes courage for a student to uh, disagree with their professor. Uh, you know, and that the, the, the welcome environment that you create to foster that, uh, all of that takes hard work and um, intention. I, I don't. I, I disagree with you. I don't think it takes hard work. Okay. I mean, if I'm spending my time putting together a class and I'm there with students, and I'm if I'm not creating that space for them, they can go read my book. You know, they they can see what I think. I, I really want to create that environment that's vibrant for them, and I want them to really be able to engage with difficult issues and feel that they're supported. I've had students who are family in the IDF and very, you know, people very much of a connection to the pro-Palestinian movements and able to have a, a civil discussion because we all understand why we're there. Nobody in my classroom is going to solve the Israel-Palestine conflict. But hopefully everybody gets a better insight in how to be a critical thinker. Well, I am sure some of the attendees of your upcoming talk on campus. We'll get to hear some of the things you do in your classroom to create that dynamic that you just described. Um, is there anything else you can tell uh, listeners what they might expect um, if they attend your talk on November 6th? It's an important general topic. I'm going to talk less about Israel-Palestine or the, the campus stuff and more about how we think about hatred. And then also, you know, something we really haven't addressed much, but to me is becoming more and more critical, is the importance of uh, preserving democracy. I want to hear what was on people's minds and things uh, that I might not have thought of, but I always find it really very useful for me when there are connections afterwards. And I'll, you know, give people my email then and encourage them to, you know, contact me. Fantastic. Well, I certainly am looking forward to it. Ken's talk will be on Monday, November 6th at 7.30 in the UC Ballroom. For more information and to register, visit umt.edu slash president. Ken, it's been great getting to know you a little bit better. I'm excited for your talk and uh, thank you for spending some time with us today. Oh, thank you for inviting me and I look forward to meeting you and everybody else uh, in a few weeks. Thanks for listening to A New Angle. We really appreciate it. And we're coming to you from Studio 49, a generous gift from UM alums Michelle and Lauren Hansen. A New Angle is presented by First Security Bank, Blackfoot Communications, and the University of Montana College of Business. With additional support from Consolidated Electrical Distributors, Drum Coffee, and Montana Public Radio. Keely Larson is our producer. Ella Hall is our production assistant. VTO, Jeff Ament, and John Wicks made our music, and Jeff Meese is our master of all things sound. Thanks a lot, and see you next time. <laughs>